the more we help others, the more value that we bring others, the more problems that we solve for others, the money always follows because it's an exchange. The natural law of exchange says that for everything I give, I should have an equal or greater amount back to me. Hey guys, I wanted to jump in here really quick to give you a free gift for listening to the Lucky Titan podcast. This is going to be something that is truly going to revolutionize your business. Can't wait for you to see it. Check this out. Are you ready to share your message with the world? Introducing PitchDB, the all-in-one platform revolutionizing the way speakers connect with podcasts, conferences, and media outlets. With access to over 3 million platforms, finding your perfect speaking opportunity has never been easier. Our AI integrations create personalized bios and pitches, setting you apart from the crowd. Join the movement of speakers taking the world stage today. Join now at pitchdb.com. Wasn't that awesome? I am so excited about PitchDB and thank you PitchDB for giving us the free one month trial to anybody who's a listener of the Lucky Titan podcast. So guys, if you want to claim this, all you have to do is click the link somewhere here in the description or head to pantheon.fm forward slash pitch. Once again, guys, that's pantheon.fm forward slash pitch. Cannot wait to see you guys there. So now let's hop into the episode. Okay, Dr. Fab, I really want to kick this one off. Yeah, for those listening to this in particular, that, that you should know that uh, Dr. Fab and I have been kind of dancing around each other's world all year. <laughs> and what was so interesting is everybody came to me and said, Josh, you've got to meet Dr. Fab. He's doing some really incredible things. I've been invited to your events like six times, haven't made it. Literally last week, we were in the exact same city with events, but I was speaking at one event, you were running your event. Um, so I'm like, okay, you obviously, you're somebody that the world needs to know. Um, and then deep diving into you and what you've done, um, I see why. So I'm very excited to have you here, man, first off. So welcome to the show. Um, excited to get hopping into this. Well, thank you, Josh. And you know, I'm a big fan and I'm just grateful to have this moment with you because, you know, every time we have a conversation, usually something great comes out. So let's just <laughs> have a conversation like we always do. Let, let's do it. Well, and, and I got to give a little bit of context here for those who, um, who haven't maybe, maybe haven't heard of you, which would be a surprise. I'm actually surprised you and I haven't crossed paths. It, it really... It actually kind of blows my mind, but the, you know, your, your history, you know, you, you had a practice as a doctor, you end up basically taking over a, a failing university, scaled it up to being one of the most successful universities in the country. And then you've built multiple successful companies. You know, you've, you've done all of these things. And it feels like just by, based on our conversation, this wasn't like published anywhere, but based on our conversation, it was because of the relationships that you're, you built. You take the time to give value. And, and I'm just kind of curious, like when you're approaching, you, you've approached each of these projects, do you feel like relationships are the, the core factor for you when you, when you grow them? Do I feel that there's a way? That the relationships are kind of the core driver <laughs> for each of, these, of the, each of these projects? Well, one of the things that I've learned uh, in my evolution, because really we're all evolving, we're becoming better every day than the, where we were the day before is the fact that the one consistency where opportunity comes from is not necessarily how many degrees I have, which I have many, how much uh, discipline I have, how much uh, contacts uh, I may have. Uh, it's really the relationships. The relationships that I cultivated is where all of a sudden you have people that come into your life. And when you have that authentic connection, I call it, where you can truly be yourself and not pretending to be something you're not, not bragging about the accomplishments you've had because the more humble you are, the more authentic you will become. Uh, but actually just getting to know somebody for who they are, for who you are, nothing to gain, just, just get to know each other, are the ones that lead to somebody calling you and saying, hey, listen, you know, I want you to consider doing this business with me or uh, this, my friend, so-and-so is looking for somebody to do this uh, project. I think you will be ideal for that. Almost everything that I've done in my life had actually come from that, from the relationships that I've made and people that got to know me well, and they felt that I would be a resource or value to someone else out there that it was creating something wonderful. Oh, that's awesome. Well, out of curiosity, who... Who would you consider is like your closest business relationship? You don't even have to share a name, but, but why are they your, your closest business relationship? Well, I would say well, that's a good one because it's, it's transformed over the years, right? Yeah. Uh, 
Initially, uh, I had a mentor called Dr. James W. Parker. He was the most successful doctor of chiropractic in the world. And he was the founder of my university. And when he started mentoring me as a student, you know, I kept asking, why me? You have kids, you have grandkids, people that you can mentor. He said, because I see myself in you. And one day as we got to know each other years later, he said, you were hungry, you know, like Les Brown always reminds me, you got to stay hungry. Well, I believe that that relationship professionally was the biggest in the beginning, because through that relationship with Dr. Parker, he's the one that later on put me on the board of the, of the university. And the other board members began to see that when he passed away, they felt that it, I was the one to succeed him, even though it was one of the most highest responsible uh, positions in our industry with over 400 employees, three entities to manage. And here I was 33 years old, never applied for it, but they felt that I was the right one to do it. Uh, so I believe that that relationship led me to getting myself out of my comfort zone, which allowed me to grow not only as a business uh, administrator and somebody that is truly responsible for a lot of people's lives, but also an individual that made connections at a much higher level that led me then to all of the other things that I ended up doing after that. Mm, that's good. When it's, it's always interesting to me that it's, it's usually the first relationship that you make. Cause I, I have, uh, you know, I, I started local businesses, did okay with those, but then we finally like bridged into and these other online space and got, got better at what we do. I, I met a, I met a mentor who, and this is over a decade ago now, and we're still, I text him probably uh, two, three times a week, just back and forth about what's going on. And I've had amazing people since then who it, people would consider to be more successful since more successful than him. But we just built that relationship to the point that I, I mean, there's, it's not going away, you know? And I, I'm kind of curious with this in particular with you, Dr. Fab, because you know, you've done a lot of big things in your career. And so you've probably gotten to the point where you're getting multiple opportunities every single day. People are coming to you with opportunities, they're coming to you with relationships. And I'm curious how you choose which ones to pursue. Because if you look at, I mean, I'm, I'm not even nearly as far along my journey as you are with entrepreneurship, but I, I get three to five people a day offering me something. Hey, why don't we partner? Hey, why don't we do this? And, and juggling those relationships has actually been really difficult for me because I'm a people pleaser. I love to be friends with people. And so I love to, I love connecting with humans. So saying no has always been hard to me. So when you, when, when you look at an opportunity, you look at somebody, what is it that, that calls your attention and has you uh, kind of draws you into an opportunity? That's a great question. And I know you're very humble and I know how successful you are. So I don't, I don't think I would agree with you, but I would tell you this. I think that the important thing is to recognize that it's more important to be able to say no to an opportunity than it is to be able to say yes, the more uh, successful that you become in life. Right. Because you only have so much bandwidth, you only have so much time, and you only have so many resources that you can put into a particular project. Mm -hmm. So in my evolution, I remember there were times that I was handling 16 different projects at one time. And it was getting to the point that I was like, wow, how do I continue to do that? Now I do what is called the rule of three. I manage up to three projects at one time, and I have what is called the parking lot. The parking lot is where somebody like you may call me and say, hey, Fab, uh, I was uh, exposed today to this amazing opportunity. I think this will be great for you. I put it in the parking lot, and until I finish one of my three, I do not bring anything over. Because mm -hmm. what I realize is that three is my sweet spot where I can give all of my energy, all of my attention, all of my resources to ensure that that opportunity is going to succeed because it's going to require everything you have in order to be successful. And when you're trying to do too many things at one time, unfortunately, something has to give. And usually it's the ones that you care the most about because you're trying to support or help somebody else that you care for. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and how do you maintain relationships with the with the parking lot relationships, right? Because I know for me, everybody comes to me and they're like, it's a today problem, right? Everything's urgent. It always feels yeah. urgent to them, right? And for me, I'm like, it's not urgent to me. And and if you get to know me, I'm a very like introverted, slow moving person. So like, 
anyways, I, I've had I've had people get mad at me because like, you're not moving fast enough. Like, well, well, the main thing is to be honest with them, right? And say, listen, man, there's nothing more that I would love to support you in this project. But unfortunately, I find myself overwhelmed already with the three that I have. And then what I typically like to do is recommend them or introduce them to somebody that may be very valuable to them, but it's not me. A lot of times, as you know, people may come to you and say, but Josh, I really want you. But unfortunately, you may not be available. Now, as long as you, this is what I've learned over the years. When somebody comes to you with an opportunity, number one, they, wanna, they want you to listen. So I'm a good listener. Number two, they want you to validate them, meaning, hey, Josh, that's a great opportunity, man. I'm so proud of you. I'm so, uh, uh, I'm so excited about your future because I know with this, I know you're going to have a great impact in the world. Uh, but then, I, then you tell them, I said, unfortunately, I cannot do it myself right now. But what if I introduce you to Billy or Jane or Sally? Uh, I believe that there will be great collaborators with you. And I believe maybe they may even do a better job than I can. So I never leave them necessarily hanging. I try to find some kind of solution, but not feel like I have to be the only one to do it. Because unfortunately, right. then I'm not taking, uh, I'm not uh, honoring the projects that I've already committed to. And that's really the key. Many times we compromise our own values for the sake of supporting someone else. And I've learned that that is not the right thing to do for yourself because if you don't value the things that are important to you, other people won't. So I got to show my team, I got to show my customers, my clients that they're my number one priority. But I also doesn't mean that I can help support by introducing other people to those other projects until the parking lot allows me to move them over. That's a really good way to look at it. Actually, I love that. I hope you guys are taking notes if you're listening to this because I want to highlight something you said that I thought was interesting. I I think what a lot of people forget to do is to actually say no. Um, that's been a hard one for me because I have a really hard time saying no. And I've noticed that if I haven't officially said no, they keep coming thinking that I had said yes. And so you, you have to use the word no. <laughs> Unfortunately, no, I won't be doing this project. And they go, okay, okay. He's actually out. So I, I think that's really interesting, actually. So people took note of that um, with your story. So, you know, right now, what are your three projects? Just out of curiosity, what are those three big ones for you right now? Well, one of the things is that I have been uh, building a new business called the Fab Lab Mentorship. And that came out of nowhere. I wasn't really looking for a new business, uh, yeah. but I've had many people in life that I supported that kept saying, hey, I'm looking for a mentor like you. I'm looking for somebody to coach me or guide me. And masterminds, as you know, have become very popular. But I didn't want to do a regular and typical mastermind. So I came back home and I started thinking about what are the three things that most people ask me to do? And in those days, this was eight years ago, it was how do I become a best-selling author, which I've done it four times? How do I become a public speaker uh, to get paid? I charge $25,000 for the last 32 years. Uh, and I've been doing that, uh, and I do about 60 lectures a year. And how do I get on the media, which, as you know, I, uh, I'm the media expert for shows like Dr. Field, The Doctors, Fox News, and many others. Uh, so I started there, and it grew to 15, then 25, and then I started adding some other things, business acumen, entrepreneurship, relationships, uh, balancing life, intimacy with your partner, all of these things, and now we have over 100 uh, CEOs that I mentor. Wow. Well, one of those mentorships is a, is a, my lower tier. We just decided to make it more of a virtual where we do three calls of an hour a, a month uh, instead of the one-on-one -on -one with me every week. Uh, right. And that one now I think is going to be a wonderful way for me to help so many more people that I just don't have the bandwidth of doing 30 minutes a week like I was in the past. So we're launching that in a couple of weeks, and I think that's going to help a lot of people uh, be able to do that. The second one is I created six nutritional solutions to the biggest problems that the pandemic caused, uh, you know, lack of energy, lack of sleep, overweight, uh, lack of immune system that is powerful, mental decline or mental uh, cognitive decline, they call it, like Alzheimer's, dementia, and then, of course, pain. So these nutritional solutions are going to be also uh, being able to be released to the world. So that way they have the highest ingredients that you can find in science. 
at the right dosages that are high level that give you the clinical outcomes that people are looking for, and not just something that you just buy on online or, or, or in a grocery store that you don't even know where the, those come from. And yeah. then the third one is uh, I'm working right now is I do uh, I write books. So I have a brand new book coming out and I'm going from healthcare to entrepreneurship in this new book. Uh, and that's launching in a couple of uh, months. And then I'm also talking to a couple of the networks that have asked me if I would consider doing a network television show. Uh, we don't have a doctor on television for the first time in 25 years. Uh, so that's why I thought, okay, maybe this will be a good opportunity to bring all of my 35 years of experience in this, in this area and bring it to the masses as my own show and not as an expert, which I've been doing for many years. Uh, so those are the three main ones that I'm focusing on over the next six months. And I have a lot of other things in the parking lot, but those are the three that I'm really <laughs> yeah, focused on. The main focus. I love that. It, it, what if, what, okay, I'm going to highlight something else about this I think is interesting. None of those are really directly tied to each other, right? They're all three no. separate companies almost. Entities, right? yeah. I mean, would three you corporations? Would you, yeah. Three corp if you've ever been on a board, it's like you show up once a month for a meeting and they're happy right. you're there and they send you a check, which is awesome. Um, but, you know, breaking it down to three businesses, all of my businesses are like interwoven and it causes a lot of problems sometimes because they're too similar. Um, because we end up going, is is this an LME thing or is this a Pantheon thing? Like, what, which what are we going to put this under? So it's, anyway, it's just so interesting to me um, that you're doing that. So I, there really isn't another doctor on TV right now? No, because, uh, well, we have the Dr. Phil show, uh, but we're doing reruns this year. Uh, and then uh, he's trying to think about what he's going to do next year. And then the Dr. Ross show was uh, changed because he went into politics. Uh, and there's nobody else uh, left right now on that, wow. network television. See, that's interesting. Because like, even Dr. Phil, like he's a doctor, but I would also consider that more of like a drama versus a yeah. An actual. A, but if, if, even though imagine he's still number one after Oprah retired. That show has not dropped in any way over the last uh, wow. It's been twenty five years now since we started. That's for him. Yeah, and you're part of the network on that one. Yeah, I'm a health expert contributor to that one. The doctors. Uh, we also took that show off the market about a year ago. So that was uh, so it was Doctor Ross and the doctors and Doctor Phil were the three main network television doctor shows. Huh. Well, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you my vote if you want it. I think that'd Thank be really you. interesting. I'll, I'm, really uh, I'm excited because one of the networks also owns the number one Hispanic network. And what I'm trying oh, to pitch to them cool. is that I would do it in Spanish and it would do it because I'm also the health expert for all the Spanish networks. Uh, I can do it in both languages. It's never been done by one person where you have two different networks with two different languages done by one person in the history of television. So they love the concept. Uh, so I'm very excited because I think this could be something that could really help me impact the lives of a lot more people. But more yeah. importantly, I love television because I like to bring things to an elementary level. You know, on television, they teach us uh, you have a 30 second soundbite because the attention span is so low. I think mm -hmm. that based on recent books that are written, like The Goldfish, uh, it's three, uh, I think it's nine seconds now, not 30 seconds. And then wow. also you have to speak at a fifth grade level. You know, so when you speak in national television as a doctor, most doctors want to throw out their fancy words and terms, but the public doesn't get that. So I like to take a complex subject, bring it down to an elementary level that a fifth grader can understand and more importantly, implement because that's the key. Yeah, that's so cool. I need connect you with a guy's name is Dr. Michael Turner. He's very involved in the, the COVID space, actually. So love it has a whole platform for it. That's so interesting though. Yeah, it's funny because obviously it's not a space I'm in, but I, I hadn't realized there weren't other shows like that. And it'd be so nice for them to not have to translate what, you know, from English to Spanish. Do you mind me asking where you're from? So I was born in Colombia, South America. My really? dad is Italian descent. Uh, so we, that's why we all have Italian names. My brothers and I were five boys. Yeah. And, uh, and then we live in the States. So, uh, very blessed because I've lived in all three areas and uh, all those three cultures have really made me who I am today. That's a, I have a lot of Italian blood in me too. So it was like, just kind of curious because it's definitely an Italian name. But, Fabrizio. Uh, Fabrizio, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I was like, I'm pretty sure because I speak Spanish as well. It's like being, uh, 
I was like, I'm pretty sure you're, you're from uh, South America, but that's, that's actually yeah. really interesting to me. It's so always... we're from the, I'm from a city called Barranquilla, which is the same city as Sofia Vergara and Shakira. Oh, yeah. So our mothers have grown up with each other. So it's kind of interesting. The three of us came from the small city. Well, actually, it's not a small city. It's one of the largest cities in Colombia, but not a very well-known city in the, in the country. Yeah. Uh, but it's beautiful. Oh, that's amazing. Do you go back often? Yeah, we try to go back at least once a year, sometimes twice. And then we go to Cartagena also, which is my favorite city in Colombia because you have the water, you have islands there. And also the people, the culture there is very colorful. Uh, it's like all the streets and the houses are painting it in bright colors, like similar to the old San Juan, Puerto Rico. Right. Uh, but it's so beautiful. And the food, oh my gosh, the food is amazing. Yeah, that's so. Uh, I spent a ton of time in Mexico. Um, and in Guatemala, but I've never gone as far south as Colombia. Oh, you would love it. You would love uh, it. Yeah. We'll go together. Oh, uh, yes. If you ever go out, let me know. I'd love yeah. to go. I love going with locals, anybody who's lived there, because it, it's just a, it's a game changer. It's an absolute game changer. Um, total tangent there, but I'm just, I was just genuinely yeah. curious. I, I've watched a lot of times when people come on my show, they, um, people are just kind of curious where they come from, and everybody we bring on has like eight different, cultural ties it's so intriguing to me i should start a whole show on it because it just intrigues me like where people come from and how that's fed into their success and and as part of that i was kind of curious with you when you um because you talked about having a spanish network right um spanish speaking network do you do you feel like you would um like a lot of what you teach here actually directly applies in the in a different culture like that like if you were to go bring what you're doing here and bring it to colombia do you think that it would yeah everything kind of translates well. So when I was doing CNN Espanol, uh, you know, I was flying to Atlanta to do that show almost weekly. And I did it for 17 years. Uh, they have 28 million viewers in all Latin American countries, including Spain. So all of Central South America and Spain uh, were part of the network. And I asked myself that question because what I do is when I talk about principles or behaviors, they're universal. Right. The more you travel, I, I remember my dad saying to us, the best gift that we as parents can give you boys is to take you with us all over the world. And what happens is you learn when you travel around the world that there is no difference in China or South America or Europe or Canada. People are people. We're human beings uh, that happen to be in a different setting or geographical setting. But the reality is that we all have to get up in the morning and we all try to do the best we can with what we have. But those concepts that I try to talk about are the ones that are mostly universal because when you travel, you tend to think globally instead of locally. And that's why one of the greatest gifts my parents gave us was we, we travel a lot with them as young people. And I still, I'm on a plane at least twice a week for the last 30 years that I can remember. Uh, wow. And that's because I'm on, uh, I do a lot of lecturing. Uh, and I love every time I get invited to a new place that I haven't been, I just get so excited like a little kid because I learn about the culture. I learn about the language. I try to speak the language. I try to do anything fast that I can learn even a few words just to get me going because I want to live and immerse myself in that culture. And that's what I try to represent whenever I speak to the audiences. Gosh, that's cool. You know, we, we've, um, we do a lot of projects over in the African countries because um, we're trying to kind of build bridges between American commerce and, and African commerce. And what's really interesting to me is that people think that these other countries don't have, like people couldn't afford their services. And I'm like, man, I, I think that's such a naive way to think about it. Cause here in the U S we feel like, well, this is where most of the money is. And it's just not true. I mean, there's, um, if you've ever been to these other countries, you're like, there's, there's 15 times the amount of millionaires in Africa than there are in the United States. Yeah. Cause obviously population is significantly bigger, but you're like, that's plenty of people who would buy your stuff and want to know your, your leadership stuff. And most of them speak English. And so it's, it's interesting to me. So I, my, my encouragement to anybody listening to this is to take an opportunity to go out and actually do business outside of the country, especially yeah. if you're a speaker or a coach or a trainer, because there's, there's very little competition in those places too. I mean, it's very wide open. And, you know, what I learned about yeah. that too is yeah. some of the times, you know, we think that we shouldn't open another country because we don't speak that language. Uh, right. I get hired to speak in other countries. And even though I speak the language, they want me to do it in English because I perceive 
value that is greater in those countries that you come from America. So I want you to know that being from here and speaking your language, that's all you need. And you desire to want to serve people in other parts of the world. And trust me, those people will love you and take care of you because very few Americans actually do that, especially like you said, in the speaking and coaching world. Some of my biggest names that are the biggest name speakers in the world are doing more business outside of the United States than the United States because the demand is so great right now more than ever. Right. Yes, it's interesting. And I'm glad you're doing this because it's so, I was not intending to go this direction with this conversation, by the way, but it's so impactful um, going to other places. We we literally in, um, in Africa, we have a guy who wants to come have us come over to this big economic development project. Um, very excited about it. But he's like, hey, um, could you just come speak to this group? And he's and I was like, I mean, sure, I'm happy to happy to come over. He wants me to do it virtually to start. And he's he goes, cool. How, how many people can your your software handle? I'm like, oh, you'll be fine. He's like, no, like, how many people can you handle? Um, he registered 650 people for this in 24 hours. Yeah, I went. What? I mean, when was the last time we had that happen in the U.S.? You know, what I'm let saying? me give, let me give you an actionable step. Please. So one of my Please. friends is Nick Wojcic. So Nick. Uh, was born without arms and legs. He's one of the top five speakers around the world. And he's got millions and millions of listeners, but 70% of his audience is outside of the United States or the English speaking languages. So what he did, he started playing with AI and he started actually translating his content in up to 36 languages. And he opened a YouTube channel in each different language to really populate that particular country. And he blew up even more because with AI, you can pretty much translate things very quickly. And then this last weekend, I have one of my clients that came to me and said, hey, listen, uh, I, as you know, I'm in Houston and I want to really appeal to the, to the Hispanic population, but she's Chinese American. So she doesn't speak Spanish. So she said, my team created an avatar that is me but I'm actually speaking Spanish. Can I play it for you? And it was perfect language. And it was her speaking the language in an avatar, looking perfect, like if it's me and you like now, but speaking in that language. And she said they did that in seconds. And now she's actually using that avatar to populate content into that community to help them come into her very big integrated practice. So you see, you can be very creative with today's technology. Yeah. Well, I mean, and even if we didn't have that, translators aren't that expensive. I mean, you can yeah. pay somebody like a couple hundred bucks an hour and then right. they'll translate the whole thing. It's uh, it's crazy. Um, that's really interesting. Very insightful. Um, do, you have, do you have any idea which AI tools they're using for that? Just out of curiosity? Uh, oh, she gave me the, the name, but I'm not sure. Uh, but Feel free I mean, there are me. so many now. I mean, there yeah. are so many now. If if you ever figure it out, let me know. I'll actually add it to the show notes of this because I know some people oh, perfect. Will be like, yeah. like, how do we do that? Because I think it's so cool. And like, this is one of the things I love about you, Dr. Fab. And that's why I was excited to talk to you is you're one of the few people that we talk to. It's not just about business. It's really about impact and reach. And I've, that's how I've built my whole career is I'm like, I don't really care. I mean, we made enough money for me to be very comfortable yeah. pretty much for the rest of my life that I was like, okay, we're fine. Like we're fine. And it's a way lower number than people think it is. You know, what I I learned is that the evolution, because I deal with a lot of very successful people on a daily basis uh, and billionaires and people that are trying to find significance in their life. uh, Right now, I figured out that, you know, the first stage in our lives, we're looking for that fulfillment, right? We want to get things primarily, especially when we see others have it. We, We seem to be inspired by that and it drives you. And then the second part of our, the second stage of our life, we seem to be more paying attention to the relationships of of our lives because we sacrifice some of them. Our health becomes a little bit of a higher priority because many of them are getting a little bit of age, 40, 50, 60. But the last stage of our life, what I've learned, our legacy is about impact. It's about impacting as many people in a positive way with what you've learned, with what you've been blessed to experience in life, right? I teach each one of my clients that every experience in your life has prepared you for this one. Now go solve the biggest problem. Go help as many people as you can. Go support financially people. That's why philanthropy becomes, I don't know if you knew that, 
the highest number of philanthropy comes from the age of 50 to 75, and then 75 and above just skyrocketed, right? Because people really are more spending on themselves and reinvesting in their business. But what I've learned in my life, like you talked about earlier, the more we help others, the more value that we bring others, the more problems that we solve for others, the money always follows because it's an exchange. The natural law of exchange says that for everything I give, I should have an equal or greater amount back to me. So as soon as you don't violate that law and you give with a pure intention, with everything you got, you never have to worry about survival. That's been my experience. That's so good. Yeah, I had a guest on, this is like six years ago, and um, he was talking, not a doctor even, just like really interesting principle here, but he talked about the vacuum principle. I'm sure you're familiar with this, but yeah. um, like, if you're the, the best illustration of this is if you're digging in the sand at the beach, it fills with one of two things. It fills with either air or water. It can't be empty. There's no such thing as an empty space. And he's like, he directly translated that to you, you're giving value. It gets filled. And, and more people think, oh, yeah, it's just spiritual blessings, right? You know, like if you're a believer in God, it's like, oh, God blesses you. And you're like, the answer is yes. But I also think there's like a metaphysical <laughs> Um, property to this where where if you do give value, it does end up coming back. And it's so intriguing to me um, because people feel like, oh, that's just making content like in the US, right? This is where everybody's like, oh, I'll just make more content. And that's usually not the case. It's it's not just giving contact. That that value is just kind of a given. So you have to go above and beyond and give value that what do they actually need? What do they actually want? Um, how do I give it that to them completely for free? Give them immense value. You know, I, I love you know what I you know what I yeah, go down to is that that giving of value is directly proportional to your self worth, and your self worth wow. is what actually dictates your quality of life. Because if you don't believe or love yourself enough, or you think you're valuable enough, no one ever, no one will ever place a value on you that is greater than the one you have for yourself. I have found that to be true always. So I tell my children. You have to know your worth so other people can appreciate what you're worth. And that net worth actually is directly proportional to your self-worth. So your self-worth, the more good, the more value, the more contribution you bring to the world, your net, your self-worth rises because now you realize, wow, you're really helping people out. You're really growing things. You're really impacting people. And that self-worth actually becomes your net worth, not only financially or spiritually, but actually physically in, in opportunities, in finance, in everything you can imagine. So that's what I try to focus on. It's really always focus on that contribution because that's really what determines your current value today. That's so interesting. I was trying to write that down. I have to go back and re-listen that because like that was that was potent. But it's really like your self-worth, your net worth, and your level of giving are all like the they same. equate, they equate yeah. each other. Yeah? yeah. We'll come up with a fun equation for that. My math brain will kick in there. <laughs> well, uh, I always tell people this to make it very simple. If you work for, for a company and you want to make more money, try to figure out what greater value can you contribute to that company that they're not asking you to do, that is not in your yeah. job description. And the way you raise your, self, your value, your net worth, is by actually contributing more than you're currently being paid for. You're being paid for what you're actually doing. So if you want to earn more, you better figure out what somebody else may not be doing or what the company may need, or maybe open up new channels for that company that they haven't thought about. And then all of a sudden now they're like, hey, would you head that? Why don't we give you a promotion? And now your net worth grows because you figure something of value that you can give above and beyond than the current value that you were being paid for. Yeah, that's that's powerful. We're going to totally title that. The, <laughs> the episode title is going to be that. That's that's good. Um, <laughs> I'm like Pat, you and I love it. I love it. On that one. Um, so so can I can I ask you for a? I know you've already given some really good action steps to people, yeah. but can I ask you for an action step? If somebody's like most people listening to this show, let me just give this some context. Most people listening to the show are doing less than a million dollars a year, right? They're probably a coach consultant agency type. That's pretty much who we attract. And so they're like, man, I don't have much to give because I don't have much, right? How would you recommend that they start giving? And like, what would you recommend they start giving? So I came up with a formula many years ago that I teach it to my clients. 
and it's a four question formula. And if you follow this process, I promise you, there's nothing you can attain. The first one is clarity. Asking yourself the question, what do I want? I have found that the main reason, not the only reason, but the main reason people don't attract what they want is because they're not very clear as to what they really want. So all of a sudden you see somebody else have something, I want that. You see on the TV something or in a movie, I want that. <laughs> you haven't really explored, do I really want this? Okay, so what do I really want? The second question, which is critical, what is keeping me from having it? And what you find is that most of the time, you have access to that, except you have a lot of distractions. You're spending your time, money, and resources in places that do not going to get you to where you want. So w identifying those things in your life are critical. And then the third one, what must I do today to have it? You realize that the only thing that you have is this moment. And it doesn't matter what you have planned for tomorrow or what you did yesterday. What must I do today? One step that you're going to take today to be able to have that that you want. It could be writing an article. It could be creating a speech. It could be booking something. It could be making 10 more calls a day uh, that are sales leads with your sales leads. And then the last one. And I didn't figure the last one out until the last couple of years. How does this serve someone other than yourself? See, I find that when you find out what you want, what is keeping you from having it, what must you do today to have it, and then add the component of how does it serve someone other than yourself, now you have the perfect combination to really create and manifest anything you want in life. Gosh, that's cool. Guys, I hope you, if you're driving, you actually pulled over and wrote that down. <laughs> I'm going to add that into the notes too, because that, that was powerful. So can I, can I just repeat the four questions so everybody make sure I met, didn't miss and everybody has it? Yeah. So the first one. one. Yeah. So what, what do I want? What's keeping me from having it? What must I do today to have it? And how does this serve someone other than myself? Yeah. Perfect. That's powerful. That is so powerful. See, people like you, you always have really good frameworks for this stuff. This is why I bring you on because I'm like, <laughs> this is a genuine curiosity of mine. I feel like at times, even for myself, I really am trying to build my life around the phil the phil philanthropy side. Whew, that's a hard word to say. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying it's to build my life around it. <laughs> what was that? It's a mouthful. Oh, absolutely. So I try to build my life around that, but then there's there's moments where I, I realize, wow, I'm making very selfish decisions right now, you know? And it might be not the same way that some people feel like is selfish, but but for me, it's wow, I'm I'm doing this literally just so I can make more money. I'm not doing this because it's you know, serving somebody else, benefiting somebody else to another level. Well, you know, I, I often say this to people because I realize that why you attract yourself as money is directly proportional to your self-worth, to how you feel about yourself and what you think you're worth at that moment. So mm -hmm. I always tell people, do not value your worth as to where your reality is today, but where you were destined to be tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. So start acting like, feeling like, thinking like you already have what you don't have yet. That's how you break that cycle. How so you go from today making $100,000, tomorrow making $500,000. It's by changing your thinking and changing your behaviors towards that. So you have to really play with yourself uh, mind mentally because 95% of your reality is in your subconscious mind. It's not even in your reality. It's what's been programmed there for years. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is that even if you're not making a lot of money right now, give yourself the opportunity to make money for the sake of supporting those that you want to help. There's nothing worse in the world that a friend of yours says, hey, man, uh, I really need a life or death operation. I need $10,000 and I don't know where to get it. And you're not being able to save that life. Or somebody actually that just lost their job and they don't have money to feed their children for the next month or somebody that ha is having some kind of crazy uh, circumstance in life that just popped up out of nowhere and you don't have the ability or it may be a foundation that is trying to do good for the planet good for people and you want to support them and when they ask you for help you say to yourself man i just don't have anything to give so inspire yourself that even if you don't want it for you because there's some people out there that say oh i don't want to try that much money in my life attract the money for the sake of sharing it with those projects that you believe in 
and that may help you get out of your comfort zone enough to get you to do the things you want to do to make more money. Yeah, that's so, so powerful. And, and guys, I, I wish I could talk to you all day, Dr. Fab. This is really valuable. <laughs> we um, can do episode one, is, episode two, episode yeah. three. Next time we'll have to do it in person, though. I'm getting really sick of these whole virtual interviews. So yeah. um, we'll, we'll definitely do it in person next time. But we'd love to have you back on. Thank and guys, you. if you want more Dr. Fab, just go to Dr. Fab Mancini, which is M-A-N-C-I-N-I. -I. Yes. So drfabmancini.com. Um, he's got all of his content. Everything's there. This is probably one of the biggest givers that I've ever met. So Dr. Fab, thank you for coming on. That was a really awesome interview. I appreciate your time. Thank you for the opportunity. You bet.